What is your name? Charles Marshall. And uh, are we alone? No. What do you mean by the word we? Well, there's an awful lot of us on this planet. So in that sense, we're not even close to being alone. So you as a human being is, are not the only human being on the planet? Correct. Okay, that's a, I, don't want to, I don't want that. I want, uh, are we alone in the universe? Ah, right. I suspect not. Okay, when I asked you that question, are we alone in the universe, did, what did you understand by the we, word we? We human beings on Earth or we the life forms on Earth? Uh, I took, take it to mean life forms. Life forms on Earth. Okay, and so you suspect that we are not the only life forms on Earth? Correct. All right, why do you do this? Think that. Because the universe is huge, yes. first point. Uh, it's clear that there are an awful lot of habitable planets uh, as the number grows spectacularly. Um, because I suspect that life originates fairly quickly given the right sort of planet. Uh, what, what evidence do you have that life originates fairly quickly? Yes. Where'd that come from? So I tend to think in terms of waiting times. As a, as a geologist, paleontologist, I tend to ask the question, what is the waiting time between events? So it's a volcanic eruption, is it every thousand years, a million years? Mm -hmm. It looks like life originated, sorry, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna change that. It looks like the last common ancestor of all currently living things originated not too long after the surface of this planet became geologically um, and astronomically stable. Um, and so I suspect the waiting time between when life could have originated and when we know it did is in order, I don't know, 100 million years, a half billion years. Mm -hmm. um, it's clearly not a billion years because we have things that date older than that. So you and I are speaking English. It took about four and a half billion years for English to evolve. Do you think that's a good waiting time that one should expect English to evolve elsewhere? So that's what I find most remarkable is the waiting time for human style sentience is really long. That's, that's kind of ridiculous. Long compared to what? The history of the planet. So my time scale is the history of the planet, about 4.5 billion. And if no life could exist for the first three or 400 million years, I suspect it could. I suspect life actually originated several times and got wiped out several times by the late bombardment. Mm -hmm. Then you get something which then persists to the present, which we call the last common ancestor of all living things. But then from that point to there, there's almost four billion years waiting time between that first life and, and, and the English language, for example. Is that a long time or short time? Um, the time, it's a proportional time, and so as a proportion. Well, you said it, was, it took a long time, as if that was longer than some normal time that it should have taken. So I, my sense of time is based on the time available, as opposed to an absolute sense of time. So if the universe were thousands of billions of years in age, then I would say the waiting time for the emergence of the human language is really short because it's only four billion years. But given that the universe is only roughly 13.7 billion and that our Earth has only had a geologically stable surface for about four billion, to wait for about four billion years for the emergence of language is a remarkably rare event. That's a long waiting time. Is this question, are we alone, an important question? Huh. That's an interesting question. Yeah, to whom, for what purpose? To you. Yeah. Why? I think it's interesting to understand how we, where we sit in the universe. How, 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 how we sit, how unique are we? How that, common are we? Well, it would be nice to know the answer. That doesn't necessarily mean it's an interesting question. Say that again? It's, it would be nice to know the answer. Oh, yeah. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily an interesting well, question. I'm, I'm a scientist. So I'm interested in all sorts of obscura. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so again, why is it an important question for you? I think it partly goes to this question of how hard it is to get life started, and once you get life started, how hard does it produce something sophisticated, whether you mean a eukaryotic cell, or even photosynthesis, um, or whether it means multicellularity, or whether it means complex social interaction, or whether it means language. So the question is, how hard are those things to achieve? So if life, if, if sentient life were, if we had evidence of untold numbers, uncountable numbers in the galaxy, then that would suggest that it's relatively straightforward and easy. Now, some so. of your colleagues, like Simon Conway Morris, think that uh, humanoids or human-like intelligence is, I guess there's a strong selection pressure anywhere that's universal that would produce human-like intelligence. And other people, like Ernst Mayer says, no, 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 that's a very species-specific kind of thing. We shouldn't expect it elsewhere. Where do you sit on the spectrum between we should never expect human-like intelligence elsewhere in the universe versus it's happening wherever life forms. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted 
the fact that it seems to have taken so long, the waiting time for us suggests that it's actually fairly hard. Um, the question is, was there human type sentience? I mean, do cetaceans have it? Uh, did some dinosaurs have it? So the question is, how do you detect it? So I'm not sure we actually know how to ascertain it properly. Uh, one of Simon Conway's Morris's arguments, which I quite like, is the fact that we have all of our sense organs concentrated in one part of our body seems relatively inevitable. That is, as you become a, het a mobile heterotroph, you need to be able to sense the world to get food. It makes sense to have all of those organs centered around your mouth. So you're assuming that animals would happen again if we replayed the tape of life from, I don't know, four and a half billion years ago? Animals. That's what you're just assuming when you made that well, argument. Well, yes, I'm being careful of the word animals. Um, if you meant a multicellular heterotroph with central, tissues. With central nervous system that allows it to yes. move. Yeah, I think so. You think that would appear again? Yes. Okay, so how about the like, trichotomy of multicellularity, fungi, plants, and animals? Do you think that's something that's fun fundamental enough on Earth that we should expect it elsewhere? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, so then you get to the question is, what are the boundary conditions that you need to cross those transitions? And so it's one of these horrible things. If the conditions are similar, the answer would be yes. If they're not, the answer is no. You don't mean cross. You mean create that trichotomy? Because plants don't become fungi, fungi don't become animals. No, no, no. Uh, 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 uh. I'm talking cross? of uh, cross in the sense of I have uh, single-celled eukaryotes, mm -hmm. each of which independently crosses the line to that multicellularity. So when I said cross, I didn't mean between animal and plant. Mm -hmm. I meant starting from a single-celled protist crossing the line to becoming an animal, and another one crossing the line to become what we call fungi, another one crossing the line to become plants. Is there a line? Well, there, no, I mean, <laughs> you sound like a lawyer, sorry. <laughs> Wait, it, was your, it was your word. You said line. Well, you could have asked me what I meant by a line. Okay, what do you, <laughs> what do you mean by a line? What I mean is that if I take any two points in time, I take a, a rose mm. and I go back in time, say, mm. two billion years mm. to, an, uh, to an organism that is the direct ancestor of that rose, mm -hmm. I've got a single celled organism there mm. and I've got a rose mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. One could at some point put a line down arbitrarily where you cross that transition. Now, mm -hmm. a line implies that it all happens at once in one place at one mm -hmm. time, and that obviously isn't the case. It's right. a sequential acquisition of... Right, but we're talking about the probability of crossing the line or not crossing the line, whatever it is. The probability of the evolution of these, tr what are currently a trichotomy of multicellular organisms, would that occur elsewhere? Yeah. Well, How I mean, would you evaluate that as a paleontologist? Well, let's just back up a little bit. I mean, I, I mean, how many macroscopic multicellular eukaryotes are there. Macroscopic multicellular? Yeah, so there's plants, animal, um, fungi, fungi. Uh, golden algae, uh, the red algae, uh, uh, the kelp. I mean, there's, there's at least six. Um, I don't know whether one counts Dictyostelian as multicellular because it's, 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 right, it's, right, it's right. facultative. Uh -huh, right. So there's in the order of 24 evolutions of multicellularity. Uh, Not necessarily independent. I would say independent. I would say not necessarily independent. Why would you say independent? Well, you made the argument earlier. Do you think there's no crossing the line between plants and animals, so therefore plants and animals are independent? No, no, they have a common ancestor. Oh. Well, yes. Well, sorry, I'm not sure what independence means now. Well, well let's, let's suppose that these planets, that there are so many all over the universe, yes. it has water. It has pretty much the same type of I guess, elements that we have here on Earth. And... Presumably, if life gets started, it will get started in a similar way because the elemental abundances and the water is there. So then, so life would get started in a similar substrate or similar environment. Mm -hmm. But then, life, I've been told, diverges and diverges, and the longer it lives, the, it kind of diverges in weird ways, kind of like words of a language. Yes. So the question is, if all plants start out with life or proto-proto-proto-life proto yes. from the same environment, how often do you get any type of convergence on what we now call terrestrial Earth life? Because, for example, you might have just viruses, and that's all they do, viruses, and they never do anything else that we call kind of cellularity. They never get cellular. Yeah, that's is that a, a possibility? That's, that's, that's not a good example, is it? Since, I don't know. Well, because so, viruses use other organisms to reproduce themselves. So. Well, how do, you so. Expect, how do you explain an RNA world, then? What's the metabolism of an RNA world? That is, those are, it's a viral world, essentially. Oh, it's a bigger world than that, I would, would have thought. But anyway, so, so I'm not sure what you're asking me. Well, so, so the, 
Mm. So the question you're asking is, so given proto-life, uh, some sort of enzymatic capability, that is the capa capacity to do repeatable chemistry, and if it's life like our life in the sense that we tend to build from the bottom up, you start with the raw ingredients, amino acids, nucleic acids, so you need instructions to construct larger scale objects like RNA or DNA or protein or... Um, well, let, let me rephrase the question. Now, in astrobiology, we're very concerned about what kind of life would be elsewhere. Yes. And Simon Conway Morris and many astrobiologists think that, well, what you have to do is figure out how, if there's an aspect of life that has evolved independently multiple times on Earth, that becomes a good candidate for what we should expect oh. elsewhere. What do you think of that logic? Yeah, I think it's incomplete. Um, in what sense? In the sense, so if you argue that I see the evolution of, say, a particular metabolism a hundred different times independently, also let's take um, C3 or C4, C, C4 or CAM plants. Now it looks like that's evolved multiple times from a C3 ancestry. So that looks like... Now, you, now you, would you do you multiple times independently? Yes, multiple times independently. From a C3 plant, the CAM metabolism or the C4 metabolism seems to have evolved independently multiple times. Now whether there's a deep homology there that makes that a little bit seem a little bit like a cheat, maybe that's true. That's what I would argue. Right. Uh, but it's possible it isn't because the chemistry in the end is fairly simple. So in that case, the argument seems reasonably good that that seems easy to evolve. If you only see something evolve once, doesn't mean that it isn't easy to evolve. So for example, one of the tricks of life is if I now am a multicellular heterotroph with organized tissues, let's call those animals, mm -hmm. one thing I'm really good is scavenging, mm. which makes it improbable that any other proto-animal is going to get a look in before mm -hmm. it gets scavenged by the earlier ones. Mm -hmm. So if I see something that's only emerged once in the history of life on this planet, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that it's intrinsically hard it might mean that once it takes hold, it prevents that evolving independently multiple times. Once it takes hold so everywhere. That, You're presuming it takes hold everywhere. Yeah, the Earth, is, the, the, the Earth on geologic timescales is a tiny place. Well, let's talk about heads then. Do you think heads, heads, things with Cephalization, heads, heads Cephalization, yes. heads, uh, so that's, I've heard it's monophyletic. No. No? Heads have evolved multiple heads. times. Oh, heads. Plants and, animal, plants and fungi don't have heads, but Correct. animals have heads, central nervous system. Well, Everything that has a head today has a common ancestor that no, no, had no. a head. You be, okay, you'll be careful of having a common ancestor and having that as the ancestral character state. Uh -huh. That's why I said everything that has a head today had an ancestor, that had, had a, a head? common ancestor with a proto-proto head, presumably. No, I mean, sponge, no? sponges don't have. They don't have heads today. They're not in the category of things with heads. Right. But they're animals. Yes, they are. But yeah, I didn't ask right. about that. I asked about heads. So the question is... Do aliens have heads is the question. So I'm going to back up just a little bit and ask the question. It depends on what a head means. So if I take the last common bilaterian, triploblast, mm -hmm. and assuming it was a wormy type thing, mm -hmm. and the question is to what extent is it cephalized? Mm -hmm. Well, it started out with a, you know, a nerve that's all along this yeah, tube, right. and then one end became... And would you call that a head? Yeah, I guess. Or, 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 or I guess, but I don't want to get into the definition of heads, but rather everything, are heads one of the things that has evolved, apparently has not evolved independently, therefore would not become a candidate for something we should expect elsewhere, therefore we shouldn't expect aliens to have yeah, heads. Yeah, so this, so, this, so this is the counter argument I just made, is once you evolve heads, say, if it prevents the evolution of independent heads, then the it fact does. that it only occurs once, yeah, yeah doesn't mean anything. Right. So why don't plants have heads mm -hmm. is one of the questions. So why don't fungi have heads? Do you think it's because animals have heads? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> and plants, I think it's because they're um, autotrophs. Uh -huh. I can collect my energy just like that. So why couldn't you have a plant, I mean a, a planet, with just plants on you it? You could. So therefore we should not necessarily expect animals on other plants, planets. Right, so then the question, so, so I want to go back to um, a strange principle, which is a, a sort of a, not a redefinition, a recasting of the second law of thermodynamics. So the second law of thermodynamics says everything runs down, right, fine. It also effectively says that you're a situation of an energy flow situation, that you have um, increased order and material cycles. 
if the energy intersects with the system in a meaningful way, it creates improbable states. Mm -hmm. And those, say, atoms can combine into molecules, mm -hmm. and then they will thermodynamically break down again. So that's the material cycling. So to my mind, the second law of thermodynamics says in an energy, flow, flow, in, in an energy flow situation, the system explores the improbable. An energy flow situation. In an energy I, thought flow they, situ I thought you produced far from equilibrium dissipative systems like hurricanes and convection cells, and you're not exploring much at all unless you have information involved. Yes. And part of the information is called life. Yes, yes. Yes, exactly. Right. So in an energy flow situation... Where there's information involved. Yes. This, okay, where the system will explore the improbable. Now, it might not explore it very far... If it's too hot and you can't form stable covalent bonds, it's not going to f f explore it very far. And so you're not going to get something that looks like life, I don't think. But what, the, what we should expect elsewhere depends on our perception of how much of parameter space has life on Earth explored. If it's a tiny, tiny billionth of a billionth of a fraction of the possibilities, then our, what we see on Earth is not a good guess of what we should find elsewhere. But if it's 100% of they're all, all these niches are filled, then what we see here is probably can be extrapolated or is a representative of life elsewhere in the universe. Oh, I see what you're saying. So can you make an estimate of how, what larger, what size fraction of all possible life forms are here on Earth or represented by any type of life form that's ever existed on yeah, Earth? Yeah, so the question is, what does that phase space look like that yes. you're trying to ask me to map out? Yes, yes. Because obviously in terms of the potential combinations of a genome of three times 10 to the nine base pairs, life on Earth is only a minuscule fraction of all that which could be explored. But that isn't what you meant. No, because no. that's already assuming you have a specific genome with a certain length. Right, but even then it's only tiny. Yeah, I know, I know. Right, so what you're really saying... So I'll go back to Simon Conway Morris, Morris's argument that if I have a multicellular organism that has tissues that is a mobile heterotroph, that cephalization should follow from that, I think, conditioning on, okay. on nerves. Let's move from cephalization to human-like intelligence, because George Gaylord Simpson wrote you an article called The Non-Prevalence of Humanoids, or yeah. Hominids. And uh, I think Ernst Mayer at Harvard, you must have talked, maybe you talked to him about this issue in 1995. He had a big debate with Carl Sagan about this issue. Carl Sagan says, oh, there will be functionally equivalent humans elsewhere in the universe because there are multiple pairs to intelligence. Ernst Meyer says, no, this is, only ha this is a species-specific human-type intelligence you're talking about, not something that's generic. And so they really didn't resolve that issue. Where do you stand on that? Should we expect intelligent aliens where intelligent means human-like intelligence that have made telescopes and cameras and yeah, spaceships? Yeah, that, so then you come back to the waiting time. And to me, waiting time? Yeah. How long would you have to wait for a sulfur-crested cockatoo? Well, so you've got to be careful about whether you're asking me about... A species-specific characteristic or a more generic thing. So, uh, a, a vertebrate that can fly? No, I'm talking about sulfur-crested cockatoo as a species because human-like intelligence is species-specific. Right? Uh, so we're talking about the, the occurrence of a single species. You're, that you're assuming that it's, that it's species-specific. Well, that's what Ernst Mayer assumed. Carl Sagan assumed just the opposite, that it isn't. Yeah, exactly. So, so what do you your, 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 yeah, right. your question is presuming that it's... What do you assume? So I'm going to go back to the waiting times again, which is it's only appeared once, and it does seem to be this strange threshold effect... I mean, I don't think there's a lot different between us and what we were capable of, say, two million years ago. But two million years ago, you wouldn't even vaguely conceive of cameras recording people sitting in chairs. That would have seemed but, inconceivable. But waiting time is a physics idea. It's, it, and I'm not quite sure it's a biological idea. I mean, all this whole debate about historicity and, and, the, the, and Stephen, uh, Stephen Jay Gould's talk about well, we need some grand patterns that we can use to predict things. Yes. And then you have waiting times. But if everything's quirky, one damn thing after another, I mean, you can wait an awful long time before people start speaking not a language, but English exactly. Yeah, well, I mean... Now that's a waiting time would be meaningless in that case. Well, of course. And I, I've not been talking about that type of waiting time. Right, but isn't a human species the same, similarly quirky to a, to a language, to the specific human? Well, English I mean, language? ours is... I mean, I've often played thought experiments as what would, what, would, what would culture look like if there were sentient shrimp 
Mm-hmm. or sentient sand dollars, mm-hmm. or sentient squids. So this is planet of the squids, then. planet of the shrimps. Then. Yeah, so the point is playing the same sort of experiment, which is if, if other species crossed that line where they were able to produce technologies of some kind, what would that like, look like given this, the uniqueness of their biology? I, I don't, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested, will they cross whatever line you've drawn? For example, something called the planet of the apes. If we, if we go extinct, let's say in 100 years we have a war, and all humans die, is there such a thing as a intelligence niche or a human-like intelligence niche which will then get filled by another species? Hmm, that's hard. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm just thinking back to my knowledge of the emergence of our own species and the conditions that seem to have made a difference as to why gorillas or chimps haven't crossed that line. Crossed the line? Well, we haven't crossed the line. That is produce a space shuttle. We haven't crossed the line to become a chimp. Why should they cross the line Uh, to become a human? You're beginning to frustrate me here. I know, I know. I mean... That's okay, I'm not... (laughs) Well, (laughs) sorry, it's just... (laughs) you're, You're setting up conditions for a thought experiment and then when I try to answer it mm-hmm. you then just play a, a fallacy on me and that's getting very very frustrating okay. and so I'm trying to answer a question in a logical way that's consistent with your questioning mm-hmm. and then when I start to do so you derail it mm-hmm. by going back to crossing the line or something and so I need you to agree okay, okay. to your own <laughs> rules or not okay. <laughs> all right so uh, let's should we expect aliens with human-like intelligence? I'm going I'm to ask you a question. Okay, go I'm going to ask you a question. What's the answer you're expecting? And what's the range of answers that you're expecting or wanting? Because you, I, I feel like I'm being steered constantly. Well, so the, I, the problem is that I've interviewed many people about this and gotten so many different answers that I kind of I don't know what, what the answer is. And I'm hoping to take advantage of your expertise to kind of point maybe in a reasonable direction. Okay. And because you're a paleontologist, you've studied big patterns and one of those patterns might be evolution towards human-like intelligence in the way that Ernst Mayer talked about. He's an ornithologist, and he talked about this yeah. with Carl Sagan. So I thought that maybe you said you've thought about what it would be like to have a shrimp if it had become intelligent. Right. But, the, but I'm more interested in the question, if we go extinct, what do you think will happen on this planet? Will there be, is there a human-like intelligence niche, or well, it's I, just the species specific? Well, I was answering your question. Yeah, okay. Try it again. But, 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 but you seem to be... You seem to be having trouble with the specificity of a human type intelligence yes, yes. as I opposed do. to a, a, a multicellular organism producing an intelligence yes. that, f- from an alien's point of view, might look equivalent to the yes. human. Yes, I have a gigantic problem with that. You're right. Yeah, and so, and, and so I was trying to open the phase space for you. I know, and I was trying to close it down. Exactly, and I was answering your question, so you were shutting down my answer. Well, that's by doing because so. you had assumed that human like intelligence is intelligence. Yes, that's, that's the bait. That's really the heart of the question. Is the thing that allowed us to have technology species specific, or is there some more generic niche? Right. And so, the, so, I, so my, I guess my answer to you: there is a much more generic niche. Is my answer. Right. I think it's very, why, very hard to find. Why do you think that? Because I think the opposite. Why Be, do you think? It? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, apart from humans, <laughs> so it's going to sound like a contradiction, a contradiction in terms. Mm-hmm going back to one of the arguments I made in my talk back there, is I see the same thing often happening over and over and over again in evolution. And while every species is unique, Mm -hmm. um, a lot of their capacities and the relationships and the capacities are not unique. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's where humans are odd because I think we crossed this threshold where if we go back two million years, we wouldn't have identified ourselves as being particularly special. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think. And yet we did cross this line somehow this capacity, and it was an iterative process, and it's not a line, it's a blurry region, where you come out the other end from two million years, and you go, what the heck? Telescopes. <coughs> well, Ernest <coughs> Meyer would say, Carl Sagan, you can't imagine that other species on other planets will have human-like intelligence, because we've already run this experiment on Earth, and it's only happened once, and it's therefore species-specific. Yeah, so that's the waiting time argument. Well, I don't think it was a waiting time argument. It's a, it's it's a, a uniqueness argument. Yeah, it's uniqueness. Uniqueness and waiting time, are, I see two different things. Yeah, I mean, I, they, I see them as interchangeable. Hmm. Uh, if the waiting time is the duration of the experiment and you can only run the, the experiment for the duration of the experiment, hmm. then they're the same thing. But if the experiment is much longer than that, we've got 13.7 billion years of, of evolution hmm. uh, rather than 4 billion years because we've got the whole universe, <clears throat> then the waiting times become relevant. And so Ernst Mayer had real trouble. Ernst 
biology deeply, deeply conditioned on the biology that he was aware of. And I would say that his capacity to establish a phase space within which his beloved birds and species sat was quite poor. Uh -huh. And so this, this, this distinction that Gould made between the nomothetic and the ideographic, mm -hmm. I would say that, that Ernst Meyer and that Harvard tradition was very ideographic. Mm -hmm. Our job is to describe the world as it is in its intricate detail. Mm -hmm. And they became obsessed with the intricacy of the detail, the yes. uniqueness of Homo sapiens. Yes. My intellectual approach is completely different, which is what I'm always trying to do is develop a phase space within which the uniqueness, the ideographic sits. And then the question is, how tiny is that phase space? Is it really truly unique? Mm -hmm. And what are the conditions that might me enable me to see that to pop up over and over and over again? So that's the way I approach my biology and my paleontology, right. which makes me a little bit unusual as a biologist and paleontologist. <laughs> um, well, one way of expressing, I think, the same argument is that if you think that there's selection pressure for human-like intelligence, then it's going to be elsewhere. But if you say, no, there's no selection pressure for the, a general niche, but rather this is just a, a, a particular species that is unique, then away goes this universality of the selection pressure that produced it. Hmm. Yes. I don't think there's a selection pressure that produces it. Uh, there's no question that it's an interaction between the selection pressure of reproductive success, mostly Within, this, within the lineage, not between, um, and the capacities of our own particular lineage. Okay, let me move on to a different issue. Is, is life getting more complex? On what time scale? On any time scale you want to talk about. Uh, on a four billion year time scale, yes. And how do you know this? What's how do I know? Uh, it depends on your metric of complexity, yes, but if you does. have just, you know, uh, if you start at a um, macroscopic scale, from single-celled small organisms to very large organisms that have complex organi hierarchical organization. Mm -hmm. So I've used hierarchical organization as the criteria. Yeah. You know, uh, an animal has a, a, a wide range of hierarchies, yeah. from interaction between individuals to yeah. the way the individual organized with tissues, down to the cellular level, the metabolic level, and then down into the genomic. So if, if you measure complexity hierarchically, then I would say uh, there's definitely been an increase in complexity. Okay, how about uh, chemically, if I measured it with me metabolic complexity? If complexity means, I mean, I'm getting to the information science issue, it's just how long do you need the descriptor to be? So our metabolism is, is longer than metabolisms were three billion years ago. There are more cell types. Okay. I don't know whether that's real complexity or whether it's just, yeah. yeah. How, have you heard of the Fermi's paradox? And that is, hey, if life evolves on all these planets, and then it, it, will, it will evolve intelligence, and it will evolve spacecraft, and then it will colonize the galaxy, and there's been plenty of time. Well, if that's the case, well, where are they? Yes. So do you have a favorite solution yeah. to it? What is your favorite solution? That's a bother. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the Fermi paradox is, uh, uh, which is why, why aren't we hearing the chatter? Uh, so if intelligent life capable of producing radio transmissions, uh, could evolve in 10 million years on any Earth-like planet, then there should be a lot of chatter. Or 2 billion years. <laughs> there Sorry? still would be a lot of chatter yeah, if it took but, 2 billion yeah. Or 3 right, million, right. or 4 billion, just, or 5 billion, right. or 6 billion. Sorry, sorry. So when I, whenever I look at an equation, the first thing I do is put minus infinity, plus infinity, mm -hmm. and then 0, 1, 2, and 10. Well, do you have a favorite solution to the lack of this chatter? Why isn't it? I think it's because I think... I think um, something that we would recognize as intelligence is, is, uh, is rare. The other, one, the other possibility is, of course, that it's short-lived. Yes, so self-destruction, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. The self-destruction needn't necessarily be self-destruction. Just destruction of any kind. <laughs> well, no. Oh, no, no, no. It's just um, if you ran out of resources so that you can build things that would make em emit organized EM that another civilization could pick up, but you might live happily ever after for another billion years. So you're putting an arbitrary barrier to a species, an intellig presumably intelligent species' ability to get free energy from other solar systems. No, 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 no. All I'm saying is uh, imagine that we used up all of our metals to the point where we just couldn't... Well, then you go to another planet. If you can't get off the planet, say, because well, you run out of... Well, we can get off the planet. We've got rockets. Well, I suppose... These are advanced civilizations that have had two billion years on oh, no, average. No, 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 no. So, so, so I'm saying that... 
they might be short-lived because their use of the raw resources on their planet is fast enough, oh, and they don't have the technologies to so get it runs off. runs out before they can escape. Yes, exactly. So, so you're in favor of Elon Musk then. Yeah, and so therefore, they're still as intelligent as we are, mm -hmm. or not, but they don't have the capacity to produce radio transmissions that other civilizations would pick up. So that's why I say it doesn't have to be self-destruction. Okay. Can you say something? Yeah, uh, um, intelligence doesn't mean they're curiosity. Uh, you also need to be curious to find out if there's other creatures, any interest in it. As Charlie pointed out earlier, um, right. it's what's the advantage of knowing there's other creatures out there. So curiosity might not be the same as intelligence. Uh, well, I mean, well, kind of. to, to okay, so, so the question is, uh, are there different types of intelligence? Well, here's another way of asking the same question. Um, uh, yeah. Maybe two, two more minutes, two or three. Yeah, okay. Um, if you think that there are functional equivalent humans elsewhere, like Carl Sagan did, then you could say that our closest relatives in the universe are not here on Earth, but they're elsewhere. What do you mean by closest relatives? Well, genetically, it's obvious that they're going to be here and that whatever the other planets produced in terms of intelligence, but functionally, they would be closer on some functional space rather than genetic space. Okay. You, you if you that. say so. Yeah, Is sure. You, okay. I mean, I mean, you just argue my definition, so sure. <laughs> That's fine. Now, what do you think students' biggest misconceptions are about this question, are we alone? Well, I don't know. Uh, I teach a non-majors course called Origins from the Big Bang to the Emergence of Humans mm -hmm. uh, with an astronomer, so we actually deal with these issues. Mm -hmm. um, what are their biggest misconceptions? Like, you think that? <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, I honestly don't know what their biggest misconceptions are. Okay. And how about advice for students? Do you have a, like, for example, a lot of students who are watching this MOOC are thinking about becoming astrobiologists. Do you have any advice for proto-astrobiologists? Yes. I think my advice for proto-astrobiologists is the same for almost all the scientists. You have to get the fundamental toolkits down mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, genetics, and you have to maintain a capacity to ask big and simple questions, even if the answers aren't immediately obvious. Okay. And are we alone? No. Why do you say that? Because I think the universe is vast, just the size of the universe. Um, I don't know what the probability I'd put in. I don't know whether it's 0 0.99 or 0 0.95 or 0 0.7. And by alone, you mean whether there'll be oh. other types of any type of life. So li I, I think life is I think life is fairly easy to evolve. I see. And so I suspect that life, the universe is teeming with life. Now, most people who I've talked to don't care about whether there's life elsewhere. They care about whether there's sentient life or conscious oh. life or, or godlike life. We're going to answer their questions. And oh, I see. So oh, so they're clearly not bi biologists, biologists or <laughs> paleontologists. Right. Most people are not biologists. <laughs> yeah, I see. Are we alone in that sense? Wow. I don't know. It's a, I mean, I suspect not. But I wouldn't put a P on it at 0.9999. So you suspect that we're not alone in being a sentient being because you think that sentience or human-like intelligence or intelligence of some kind is selected for uh, in a universal way? No, I don't like, I don't like the emphasis on selection, uh, though selection has to play a role. But I think that the way biology explores the improbable that even though there are some real bottlenecks that have to be got through, and if you don't get the right thing, you don't pass through it, um, it's difficult to achieve. I mean, why didn't, why didn't sentience appear in the Mesozoic? That seems odd to me. Why didn't it emerge in the Oligocene or the Eocene or the Miocene? That seems odd to me. So it's the waiting time business. So it's clearly there's some little narrow paths that have to be walked but if, but if human-like intelligence is unique, then it's infinitely narrow. Well, who said it was unique? Uh, Ernst Meyer? Yeah, I know. 